we saw that Genji had been exiled to the area of Suma for his illicit affair with the woman named Oborosukiyo. Remember her? She is the sister of the lady Kokiden, who is the consort to the former emperor. She is the mother of the current emperor, Emperor Susaku. Genji and his mother, the late uh, Kiritsubo no Koi, were always and have always been a threat. They have always posed a threat to Lady Kokiden, her son, and to her father, the Minister of the Right. In their eyes, uh, Genji is always an eyesore. Right? So she has always sought any opportunity to um, rid the capital of Genji. And she finds that this illicit affair with the woman, Oborosukiyo, is a prime opportunity to have Genji vanish from the capital. And so he begins his journey. We saw that he traveled through the area um, of present-day Osaka, right, making his way onto Suma, right, just west of uh, present-day Osaka. Right, now, after that, uh, Genji, who is now about 27, 28 years old, uh, travels next to the place called Akashi, okay, where he is introduced to the former governor of that province, the province being named Harima. Right. The um, governor is now a monk. He has already taken his religious vows. And uh, we find that Genji begins a new romance, this time with the governor's young daughter. And she is named Lady Akashi in the story. Eventually, she will bear Genji a daughter, and uh, that young girl will grow up to be the Akashi princess. Later, she will become consort to the future emperor. Right. Genji, though, is eventually going to be pardoned by the present emperor, that is again Emperor Suzaku. This is Genji's half-brother, okay, the son of the lady Kokiden. And he is going to be ordered back to the capital, back to the imperial court, so that he, he can resume his duties right, as uh, a member uh, serving uh, the imperial court, the imperial family. And specifically, he is going to be given new duties in this case. He is going to be appointed advisor, counsel, to the current crown prince, the current heir to the throne. This young man is actually Genji's own son, biological son by the lady Fujitsubo. Okay? So please turn to slide 29 in your handout. This is chapter 13, entitled Akashi. She, the Lady Akashi, knew that rustic maidens, like herself, should come running at a word from a city gentleman, a city gentleman like Genji, our ideal hero, right, the ideal nobleman, who happened to be briefly in the vicinity. Remember that he is on an exile, a journey, a journey of exile to this area. She knows that she is from the provinces, right? Her background, her upbringing, are indeed different from someone like Genji, who has been raised in the capital. Indeed, he has blood ties to the imperial family, even though now he is a commoner. Right? So she knows that their places in society are different. She knows her place, she knows his. Right? What is this comparison an example of? We have seen this earlier in the lecture. Someone give it to me. She is in the provinces. She, a rustic maiden. Genji, a man from the capital. A man from the Miyako. Hmm. What is this an example of? What is this contrast that is being made between the area that Akashi, the lady Akashi lives in, and the capital that Genji represents? What is the um, portly elegance, the refinement, the sophistication uh, referred to in Japanese? The way of the city life, the way of the people living in the capital, especially the aristocracy. What did we, we refer to that um, concept as 
in Japanese. Anybody? No? This is another example of a contrast being made between Miyabi, the courtly elegance of refined sophistication. Remember our Mukashi Otoko of the tales of Ise? Right. And then remember how he visited a number of women living in the provinces, the outlying areas, far away from the capital. Right. The ways of life in the, in the countryside and the capital are very different. They are distinguished uh, rather prominently in the tales of Ise, perhaps less so in a story like this, but still we can make this sort of comparison right, between, uh, again, the city gentleman and the uh, countryside <coughs> neighbor. Right. No, she did not belong to his world, and she would only be inviting grief if she pretended that she did. Her parents had impossible hopes, it seemed, and were asking the unthinkable and building a future on nothing. Genji called in secret from time to time. The two houses being some distance apart, he feared being seen by fishermen who were known to relish a good rumor. Genji dreaded having Murasaki learn of the affair. Remember that he has left the young Murasaki behind in the capital. Right. Some time has elapsed, of course, since he first initially found the young girl, just 10 or 11 years old, right, living with her grandmother. Remember, she passed away, and so Genji virtually abducts her and brings, him, brings her uh, back to his residence. Remember that. Um, some time has passed since then. It's been about uh, nine or 10 years. Right? So she has grown up, uh, indeed, to become the ideal woman for Genji. And she is, remember, his one and true love. Right? And he is continually troubled, disturbed by thoughts of Murasaki, left all alone in the camp. Right? And now he has begun an affair in this area, Akashi, and that only adds to Genji's worries, his anxiety that she may indeed find out. He still loved her more than anyone, and he did not want her to make even joking reference to it. She was a quiet, docile lady, but she had more than once been unhappy with him. The new year came, and the emperor was ill. This is the emperor Suzaku. And the fall set over Fort Life. The obvious course was to abdicate, in other words, to give up the throne in favor of the crown prince. The crown prince is actually Genji's son by Fujitsubo. As the emperor turned over in his mind the problem of advice and counsel for his successor, he thought it more than ever a pity that Genji, someone like Genji, with his abilities, with his talents, should be off in the provinces rather than back at court, right, fulfilling his duties. Finally, he went against Kokiden's injunctions and issued an amnesty. He issues a pardon to Genji. Late in the seventh month, in deep despondency, he issued a second order, summoning Genji back to the city. And this um, deliberation by the current emperor, uh, he turns over in his mind again and again, who should he appoint as counsel, as advisor to the young crown prince? Remember, this is still a very young man, especially by our standards. He does not have all of the abilities, the knowledge necessary to run the country by himself if he were to assume the throne. So he would need someone to advise him in the day-to-day -day affairs of administering the country. Right? So the current emperor is turning over in his mind, deliberating who he should appoint as advisor. Right? Kokiden, his mother, knows this. Right? She has known it for some time. She and her father both fear that, indeed, the emperor may appoint Genji, who has long been a threat to them, as the next emperor's advisor. This is one of the reasons she has Genji banished in the first place. Right? Of course, there was that scandalous affair with the lady Oborosukiyo, but this is another reason, a right? political reason, for having Genji exiled to Sumatra. 
Now the next chapter, 14, we will see what happens. Um, again, the crown prince is about uh, 10 or 11 now, and he is about to go through his initiation ceremonies. Right? He has grown up, and he has achieved um, the age uh, at which he can now enter into adulthood. Right? This is preparation for him to assume the throne as well. In the second month of the following year, initiation ceremonies were held for the crown prince. He was 11, tall and mature for his age, and the, mo and the very image of Genji. The world marveled at the almost blinding radiance, and it is not surprising that this young man would be described like this, because indeed he is the biological son of Genji, and remember that Genji was also described as a most marvelous, big, radiant, shining, the shining Hikaru Genji at his birth. From about the beginning of the third month, though Genji told no one, she, the Akashi lady, was much on his mind, for her time must be approaching. So now, the lady Akashi right, is with child, she is pregnant with Genji's child, and her time her delivery is approaching. Genji sent off a messenger to the Akashi uh, area, who very soon returned with the message. A girl was safely de delivered on the 16th. Right, so now Genji has uh, a daughter in addition to his two sons from uh, other unions, from other relationships. Mm -hmm. And a fortune teller has told him the following. You will have three children, right? A fortune teller had once told him. Two of them are certain to become emperor and empress. The least of the three will become chancellor, the most powerful man in the land. The whole of the oracle seemed by way of coming true. Now, the fortune teller's uh, prediction that uh, the young girl, the daughter, will become empress is a reference to this young girl who has just been born, right, the princess Akashi, the daughter of uh, the Lady Akashi. Okay. And the son, who the fortune teller predicts will be emperor someday, is the son that Genji has by Fujitsubo, right? the current, current uh, crown prince. And the other three, uh, the other of the three, uh, the other son that Genji has, uh, this son by the lady Aoi no Ue. I remember that she was Genji's uh, former wife uh, earlier in his career. They married very young, remember? It was a politically arranged marriage. Her father, uh, the minister of the left, mm, wanted to have that marriage take place. Uh, Genji also found it, Genji's family also found it um, advantageous to have that marriage take place. It was not a happy one, remember. It was not a happy marriage, and um, unfortunately for Lady Aoi Noe, she dies in childbirth, soon after childbirth, uh, after giving birth to this son. Right? He is named um, Yu Didi. We won't have a chance to look uh, into detail uh, at his uh, um, experiences in the story. However, um, he will go on to become a uh, chancellor. He will achieve this very high post, right? and he will become, by his time, the most powerful uh, leader of the country. And just so you know, incidentally, uh, the young girl that is born to Lady Akashi, right? she is actually not raised by the Lady Akashi. Right? Um, this young girl is mm, adopted, so to speak, by Lady Murasaki. Genji's one and true love. She, he has Lady Murasaki raise the young princess, or the young girl who will eventually become um, a princess and then consort to the future emperor. And this is not an uncommon practice at all for members of the nobility, especially if a man has more than one wife and more than one child of those unions. Uh, sometimes a child will be raised, will be taken into the home of the man's primary wife or, more, or the woman who has the most elevated status, uh, importance in his um, life, and will be raised by that woman. Okay, 
and you will probably want to keep that in mind. Right? Keep in mind the fact that uh, Lady Murasaki has been chosen to raise the young girl, right, to raise the daughter. By chapter 33, and we are skipping over a number of chapters simply because the story is so lengthy and we won't be able to cover all of the events and experiences that Genji goes through, but um, by, ja by chapter 33, uh, Genji has risen now to the height of his career, to the pinnacle of his career. He is nearly 40 years old by this time. He has built a grand estate called Bokujoin, and we'll look at an image of it here in a bit. Uh, the Emperor Reize, okay, there is a new emperor now, uh, and he has taken the throne, and this is Genji's son by Fujitsubo. The Emperor Reize learns the truth of his birth, his real identity, the fact that Genji is his father. And uh, eventually he will appoint Genji honorary retired emperor. Right, so, um, in a certain sense, the earlier oracle, uh, remember the Korean sage, right, much, much earlier in the story, in the first chapter, remember how he foretold, predicted that Genji was um, uh, someone who has the abilities of a true leader. He's really the only one who is fit to become father of the nation. Right, by, so, in a certain sense, that um, oracle or that prediction has also come true. New problems arise, however, toward the, uh, for this part of the story when Genji takes on a new wife. Right? And um, this is going to be a lady of um, high rank, high status, because she is the daughter of the former emperor, the emperor Suzaku. Right? The emperor Suzaku, remember, is Genji's half-brother. Right. Um, so he takes on this new wife. She is called the third princess. This is going to pose problems because Lady Murasaki does not have uh, equal rank. Right. And so this is going to pose a threat now, uh, a very real threat uh, in the eyes of Murasaki when this new woman uh, assumes her role at Genji's uh, residence. This is um, a model, a miniature model, of what uh, the grand estate may have looked like, right, Bokujoi. Notice that it has been divided up into four quadrants, right, like this, and each is associated with one of the four seasons. And the important women in Genji's life are going to be moved into this residence, and they will um, lead their lives here at Bokujoi, right, including uh, the Lady Murasaki, eventually the Lady Akashi will also um, come to this uh, grand estate right, and, and live there. Right. Now, let us look at chapter 34. This is part one of the chapter New Herbs. And a decision has been made now to have Genji marry the third princess, right, the daughter of the former emperor. It was an unsettling time for Murasaki. No doubt, Genji was giving an honest view of the matter when he said that she would not, Murasaki would not be overwhelmed by the third princess. Yet, for the first time in years, she felt genuinely threatened. Right? By this time, Genji is in his middle 40s. Right? Murasaki, of course, is about seven or eight years younger. But the third princess is much younger. She is in her mid-twenties or so okay, at, this, at this point, perhaps even a little bit younger. Um, and so there is this age difference, and there is also a difference in rank. Okay, so for the first time in years, Murasaki felt genuinely threatened. The new lady was young, and it would seem rather showy in her ways, and of such rank that Murasaki could not ignore her. The third princess was, as her father, the former emperor Suzaku had said, a mere child. She was tiny and immature physically, and she gave a general impression of still greater, indeed quite extraordinary, immaturity. He, Genji, might have hoped for someone a little more interesting. Right now, 
Notice that this description, this depiction of the third princess is in sharp contrast to uh, what we know of the lady Murasaki. Remember that we had a group discussion about the fact that Genji mm, takes the young, very young Murasaki under his wing. He shapes, he molds her into the ideal woman, the ideal wife for him. Right? She is um, the model of a court uh, noble woman, right? someone uh, who is um, uh, appropriate for Genji. Right? She knows the ways of the court. Uh, she is skilled in poetry, the arts, koto, music, etc. Right? So notice this very sharp contrast between the two women. Murasaki is the one who has been assigned the responsibility of raising the princess Akashi, right? the daughter that is born actually to another woman. Right? And we know uh, through the fortune teller's prediction, and we know through the story, the later events in the story, that indeed that young girl will eventually go on to marry the future emperor, right? And she will become empress. So she is very, very successful politically at court. So that is an indication of Murasaki's ability to raise that child in the appropriate manner, right? To, uh, to raise that girl, that daughter, um, so that she will be able to be successful at court. Mm -hmm. So this very um, sharp, distinct uh, difference uh, is being highlighted when uh, the third princess comes into Genji's life. Mm -hmm. A frequenter of the Suzaku Palace, right, Kashiwagi, this is a man, Kashiwagi had known all about the third princess and the Suzaku Emperor's worries. He had offered himself as a candidate for her hand. <laughs> to his very great disappointment, she had gone to Genji. So um, it appears that the third princess earlier has had a suitor, mm -hmm. at least one, and his name is Kashiwagi. Right? He is dejected, disappointed that she eventually goes to Genji, right? but he still believes that there might be an opportunity for him. He, of course, heard what everyone else heard, that she was no great competitor for Genji's affections. So he knows now, he knows from the rumors that Genji has no particular feelings uh, toward this young woman. So he sees this as perhaps his chance. He was forever complaining to Kojiju, her nurse's daughter. I am much beneath her, I know, but I would have made her happy. Nothing in this world is permanent, and Genji might one day make up his mind to leave it. Kashiwagi kept after Kojiju. And so he keeps after the nurse, uh, the nurse's daughter, in order to arrange a secret trust, right? a secret meeting between uh, him and the third princess. He thinks that, well, right, he knows that for one, Genji has no uh, particularly strong feelings or he shows no affection toward the third princess. He knows that Murasaki is the uh, um, one and true love of Genji's life. Right. He also thinks that perhaps since nothing in the world is permanent, mm, everything is fleeting, uh, nothing is everlasting in our world, the world of humans, that Genji might one day decide to renounce the secular world, decide to take his vows, and uh, enter into a life of religious devotion. In that case, he would no longer have ties, right? Marriage ties, in other words, um, to uh, really any of the women in his life. Right. And that would create an opportunity for Kashiwagi to um, enter into a relationship with the third princess. So, what happens next in the story? Mm. Throughout all of this, Murasaki um, is trying to uh, keep up uh, appearances and to keep up her spirits, even though um, the third princess has now entered into Genji's life. And because of this trial and um, ordeal, uh, she gradually uh, becomes ill. Right? So her health declines. And um, this uh, illness is going to be attributed to a curse by the lady Rokujo, one of Genji's former lovers. 
this uh, lady, Rokujo, uh, was also the supposed uh, cause, uh, her evil spirit was the supposed cause of Lady Aoi Noe's death. Remember, she dies uh, shortly after childbirth, giving birth to um, uh, Genji's son earlier in the story. So Murasaki's illness is also attributed to the evil spirit of uh, one of Genji's former lovers, the Lady Rokujo. And she was a slightly older woman in Genji's life. And she was um, slighted, uh, she was um, mm, jilted by Genji right, earlier in their relationship, and she is never quite able to forgive him for this. And so supposedly her evil spirit comes back to haunt him and the other women in his life. Genji will tend to Murasaki night and day, and in doing so, right, neglects the third princess. Now, you probably can imagine what kind of opportunity this will create for Kashiwagi, right? When Kashiwagi um, eventually does indeed seduce the third princess in Genji's absence. Right. Fortunately, uh, Murasaki will recover, uh, at least temporarily. It is a temporary uh, recovery from her uh, illness. But in the meantime, since Genji has been away, uh, and not at the residence where the third princess uh, is living, uh, Kashiwagi will see this as an opportunity to make his move. Okay. Let's look at part two of the same chapter, New Herbs. The third princess had been unwell since that shocking visitation. There were no specific complaints or striking symptoms. She felt vaguely indisposed and that was all. We have seen this sort of introduction, this um, foretelling of what is to come in the story before. Remember that the lady Fujitsubo was also taken with these kinds of symptoms mm, earlier in the story when she uh, became pregnant with Genji's child. So it is uh, interesting that the author uses this sort of um, a repetition um, of uh, events in the story to, um, to add to the to the interest uh, to build uh, toward the climax. Though he felt no great eagerness, though Genji felt no great eagerness to visit Lokujo, where the third princess uh, is residing, it had been some time since he had learned of her indisp indisposition, of her uh, feeling unwell, right, having these kinds of symptoms. So he called some of her older women and made detailed inquiries about her health. She is in an interesting condition, as they say, he was told. And it was his general want or lack of success in fathering children that made the news so surprising. Right? And it is um, something that we should consider, uh, the fact that uh, Genji does only have three children by this point in his career. Right? He has entered into a number of relationships with many different women, but he only has three children. And so he finds this news a little bit um, surprising. Since it had taken him so long to collect himself for the visit, to make that visit to the third princess, he could not go back to Nijo immediately. And Nijo is where the lady Murasaki is now residing. Right? She is trying to recover uh, from her illness, and so she is recuperating at Nijo. He would like to go back there, but he knows that since it has been some time since he made, uh, since he's made a visit to the third princess, he should stay at least a little while longer. He stayed with her for several days. However, after this, he makes a rather shocking discovery. He saw a corner of pale green tissue paper at the edge of a slightly disarranged quilt. Casually, he took it up. It was a note in a man's hand. Delicately perfumed, it somehow had the look of a rather significant document. The hand was without question, Kashiwagi's. Right, and this is another example, I think, a good example of how the author uses this repetition of events. We have seen a similar situation before. Remember that Genji and Oborozikyo were discovered uh, in that particular instance uh, by Oborozikyo's father, the Minister of the Right. Remember the two were uh, inside her bedchamber, a thunderstorm occurs, and they are unable to come out. Right. Eventually they are discovered. 
And how was Genji to behave towards the princess? He understood rather better the reasons for her condition. He had come upon the truth himself without the aid of informers. Well, it was all very distasteful, but he would say nothing. Right? So he decides to maintain his silence. He wondered if his own father had long ago known what was happening and said nothing. Remember that his own father, the former emperor, Kiritsubo, uh, believes that uh, the child born to Fujitsubo mm -hmm. is his, but indeed it was not. It was Genji's child. Mm -hmm. Genji could remember his own terror very well mm -hmm. from that event, and the memory told him that he was hardly the one to reprove others mm -hmm. who strayed from the narrow path. What happens in the meantime with the third princess? Well, that evening the third princess was taken with severe pains. Guessing that they were birth pangs, her women sent for Genji in great excitement. Obviously, no one else at court knows uh, the truth. He came immediately. How vast and unconditional his joy would be if, uh, he thought, were it not for his doubts about the child. The princess was in great pain through the night and at sunrise was delivered of a child. It was a boy. But how very strange it all was. Retribution had no doubt come for the deed which had terrified him then and which he, would, he was sure would go on terrifying him to the end. Since it had come, since, ha since this divine retribution had come all unexpectedly in this world, in which Genji is living now, perhaps the punishment would be lighter in the next. Hmm. What is this an example of? We have seen this uh, repeatedly uh, throughout the story, uh, a reference to the Buddhist concept of Inga Oho, Inga Oho, which holds that one must reap what one has sown. You must pay for your actions. And eventually, uh, that divine retribution will come around uh, to haunt you. And Genji believes, indeed, that his former actions uh, with the lady Fujitsubo, right, that illicit affair, has now come back in the form of divine retribution right, uh, in this manner, right, through the birth of this young child to the, to the third princess. Um, and this reference to uh, the punishment uh, perhaps being lighter in the next world because divine retribution had come now in this world and Genji is going to suffer now in this world. Perhaps his suffering will be a little bit less so uh, in the next world. This is um, associated with the idea of Uh, this idea, another Buddhist concept called Rinne Tensho, which holds that uh, all living beings are subject to go through or to experience a cycle of rebirth and death, right. living from one world to the next. It's not just one world in which one is born and then dies and that's the end of it. No, actually one is expected to be reborn in another world. Right, and one must go through this cycle. Right. And Genji believes that because his divine retribution has come now, perhaps his next world will be a little bit less painful. Okay. This is um, an image, uh, an illustration from uh, Genji Monogatari Emaki, right, the illustrated narrative scrolls remember that we had looked at earlier in the course, this particular illustration depicting uh, Hikaru Genji holding this newborn uh, child that has been born to the third princess. And uh, obviously, he is secretly agonizing over the fact that the young child is actually um, the son of Kashiwagi. Notice Genji's very um, interesting uh, expression, right? Notice that. Um, uh, he is um, probably attempting to control his uh, inner emotions. Right? So this very complicated uh, um, expression on his face, I think, has been um, depicted uh, skillfully in this particular drawing. Genji behaved with the strictest correctness 
and was determined to give no grounds for suspicion, so he doesn't want anyone to know. Yet he somehow thought that they were pellets, and was held by certain of the women to be rather chilly in his manner. The princess caught snatches of their conversation and seemed to see a future of growing coldness and aloofness. She knows that Genji um, probably knows indeed the truth, and she fears that the future that lies ahead of her and the child will probably not be a very happy one. She knew that she too was to blame, and she began to think of becoming a nun. And so now we have the third princess beginning to ponder, to consider the idea of shukke, or renouncing the secular world and taking her vows. This, again, is not an uncommon course of action, for, especially for many of the women in this story. Remember, we saw this earlier with the lady Fujitsubo, and she indeed does take her vows. She, however, um, will take her vows after uh, her husband dies. Remember the emperor, mm, uh, Genji's father, dies, and then shortly after, Lady Fujitsuko de decides that her time has come to renounce the world and take her vows to become a nun. All right, and here, um, another illustration, another painting uh, that depicts the third princess at left, uh, telling her father, who is pictured in the center, uh, that she wants to become a nun, that she wants to uh, take her vows. Her father, notice his shaved head, has already taken his vows. Right? Of course, he is upset to hear the news. This young woman, the third princess, is still very young. So it would be a little unusual for someone like this, whose husband is still living, uh, to uh, take her vows so early. Quite out of the question, this is Genji, I was thinking, quite out of the question, it would only invite trouble. But Genji was thinking that if the third princess felt constrained to say such things, if she is suffering to this extent, then the generous and humane course might be to let her become a nun. To require that she go on living as his wife would be cruel, and for him, too, things could not be the same again. So at first, Genji is adamant. He's against the idea of her uh, leaving the house, literally, shukke, and entering into a life devoted to religion. But he reconsiders. Right? And this is interesting as well, because notice how he reacts later in the story to Murasaki's, Murasaki's desire to do the same. Right? This will happen in a little bit. Chapter 40. This is not the last chapter in the tale of Genji, but it is the last chapter that we will have time to look at. Right? Um, in this chapter, uh, Murasaki, who is um, growing uh, ever more seriously ill right, from her long illness, uh, all the trials and tribulations that she has suffered over Genji's uh, numerous um, uh, relationships, and especially this uh, last uh, marriage to the third princess, she has been in a rather uncertain condition, unstable condition. Right. And in this chapter, it is this chapter that we will see um, Murasaki uh, eventually dying from this illness. Right. Uh, again, this is the last chapter that we'll have time to look at. Um, I urge you, though, to read um, uh, the remaining chapters if you're interested, especially if you would like to do uh, a paper, uh, your term paper, on uh, the tale of Genji. Murasaki had been in uncertain health since her great illness. Genji could not face the thought of surviving her by even a day. So he doesn't want to even think about living a day longer than she. Mm -hmm. Murasaki's one regret was that she must cause him pain and so be unfaithful to their vows. So she is indeed um, troubled by the fact that she might have to die before him, expire before him, and so be unfaithful to their um, vows of love. But for the rest, she had no demands. She was ready to go. She was ready uh, for the next uh, world. And she wanted now only to prepare herself for the next world. Her deepest wish, of which she sometimes spoke, had long been 
to give herself over entirely to prayers and meditations. So here is this indication of um, uh, Murasaki's desire to do the same, right? to uh, renounce the secular world. But even now, Genji refused to hear of it. So she has been making these desires known uh, to him for some time, and he has adamantly refused to allow her to do so. Right? Uh, and still now, he refuses to let her uh, take her vows. Right? So this is in contrast to his reaction uh, toward the third princess. Right? He refused originally, uh, in that case as well, but he does eventually let the third princess right, take her vows. Here we have um, a scene depicting Genji's uh, visit uh, to the ailing Murasaki. She is ill, right, and uh, he is going to tend to her in her illness, right. But eventually uh, the attempts fail, and Murasaki, after this, uh, will die. And we won't be able to look again at the rest of the, uh, uh, the story. Genji's death, interestingly, um, will come sometime after this, after Murasaki's death. Uh, it happens sometime between this chapter 40 and chapter uh, 42. Right? By chapter 42, uh, I believe it's 42 or 43, uh, simply all we know is that Genji has passed away in that time. Right, some time has elapsed right, by chapter uh, 42 or 43, and in that chapter, all we are told is that Genji has uh, been dead. Right? He has died and has, is no longer uh, living in the world. The remaining chapters cover uh, the, li the lives of, for example, Genji's child, uh, Yugiri, uh, the son born to Aoinoe, uh, the young um, child Kaoru, right, the baby that uh, was born to the third princess and is actually the child of Kashiwagi. Uh, the remaining chapters cover the lives and events um, uh, of those uh, characters right, rather than Genji himself. Interestingly though, his death is not explicitly described right, in the story. Now, one last point that I would like to bring up when we um, look at the tale of Genji. There have been a number of interpretations of this tale. Right? By the middle, or until the middle, of the Muromachi period, and this is a period that we will be looking at a little bit later on in the course. This is going to be the fourth century, uh, the 14th century. A strong trend um, toward Buddhist uh, or Confucian interpretations of this tale uh, was seen. So remember, we have been seeing repeated references to Buddhist concepts, the Buddhist concept of inga o ho, right? or mm, shikuen, or sukuse, right? the inne uh, of, uh, that talks about um, one's bond from a former life. Right, that predetermines uh, your actions and your experiences in your next life. We talked just a while ago about uh, Ringne Kensho, right, the cycle of rebirth and death. This talk, this repeated reference of divine retribution, right, this was one interpretation of the tale of Genji uh, through the middle part of the Muromachi period. Right, this was um, seen as one of the uh, the goals or the intention of the author was to show that divine retribution indeed comes to someone for his or her uh, misdeeds, actions from a former life. You must pay for your, uh, for your sins. However, um, several centuries later, the Edo period a scholar and poet, uh, Motori Norinaga, mm, advances a new interpretation of this tale, right? a new interpretation. This is going to be a literary uh, interpretation, one that does not rely directly on um, Buddhist teachings, Confucian teachings. Mm. It does not advance uh, a moral interpre inter interpretation of the story. Right. It doesn't rely on morals, reasoning, that sort of thing, to interpret the meaning, the intent uh, of this tale. 
in um, Norinaga's uh, Tama no Omushi, which was written uh, toward the late 18th century, uh, he advances this idea that the true meaning and intention of the tale of Genji was to know or to see, to recognize this particular uh, idea, and that is the idea of mono no aware. Mono no aware. So the intent of Murasaki, no, uh, Murasaki Shikibu um, in writing this story was in Norinaga's eyes to recognize the mono no aware. So what is this mono no aware? Well, in your handout, um, if you look at slide 48, uh, this is a definition uh, that is provided by the Princeton Companion to Classical Japanese Literature. Um, mono no aware, or simply aware, uh, is the reference to um, the deep feelings, it's a reference to the deep feelings inherent in or, or felt from our world, our human world, and experience of it. In early classical times, aware might be an exclamation, a simple exclamation of joy or other intense feeling. But later came to designate uh, much sadder or even tragic feelings of loss right, or um, feelings of um, helplessness right, or the fact um, that something or someone might appear even pitiful right, or these feelings of uh, pathos. Right? These kinds of feelings are indicated by aware or mono no aware. We still use the word aware today in modern Japanese. Both the source or occasion of such feeling and the response to the source are meant. So um, you can think of aware um, in a nutshell as the spontaneous, emotional, inherently human, right, inherently human, and I think this is probably the key word, uh, response to something that is deeply moving to us. We look at something, we look at nature, we might look at a scene in nature and find it moving, inspiring. That could be described as aware in classical Japanese uh, terms. We might see an event, uh, hear or read about an experience that we find moving or even um, pitiful right, or sad, tragic, and we could describe that as aware. Originally, it is believed that the word aware um, came from uh, two words, two separate words, that also um, describe this sense of um, exclamation or perhaps a feeling of um, maybe surprise or more um, inspiration uh, upon seeing something that is um, uh, moving, right? And those two words, a, hare, put together, became aware. Mm -hmm. Let us look at some examples of this aware, right, in the Tale of Genji and other works of the Heian period. From chapter one, the Polonia Fort, Nyobu was deeply moved Nyobu is going to be one of the ladies in waiting at the court of uh, the emperor Hiritsubo, the father of Genji. So this is much, much earlier in the story. Uh, remember that uh, Genji's mother dies right early, uh, soon after his birth. And um, her lady in waiting uh, takes this news uh, back to Genji's mother's family. Right? And upon her return to the imperial palace, she finds that the emperor has been waiting. Uh, he has been up all night waiting for Myobu's return. She was deeply moved to find that the emperor had been waiting for her return. This feeling of being moved, touched by the emperor's actions, mm, this is in the original described as aware. Right? Aware ni mitate matsuru. Right? Aware. The young Genji offered an impressive verse that was received with much praise. This is also from chapter one in uh, an earlier part of Genji's career. Remember that he was uh, skilled in Chinese poetry, uh, waka as well. He was um, learned in the uh, classics. And he offers an impressive verse 
This um, is also described as aware, aware naru ku. My ku is verse, right, or um, poem, right? and it is described as aware or impressive, inspiring. The poetry of Onono Komachi, this is actually not from the tale of Genji, but from uh, Hokin Watashu, the preface, right? has a gentle, refined grace and a lack of forcefulness. Aware naru yomite tsuyokarazu. So this um, poetry that Onono Komachi right, writes uh, is gentle, it is refined, it's graceful, and it is not strong, right? it is not forceful. So this is also um, something that can be described as aware. So there are several usages right, of this term. Okay. The next example is from uh, the Tosa Nikki, or right, the Tosa Journal or Diary. Remember that uh, Kino Tsurayuki had been serving a term uh, as governor of the Tosa province. This is present day um, Shikoku, right, the southern part of Shikoku. And um, upon his return to the capital with his wife and other members of the party, uh, they are about to uh, take leave of a particular location called Kakonosaki. And uh, the uh, boat captain who is in charge of taking them back is in a hurry all right, to take them back. Right, he's ready to go even though most of the members of the party are um, still not quite ready to um, say their goodbyes, right, to um, uh, give their thanks, express their feelings to the people that have um, that they have relied upon right, during their stay um, in Tosa, and they describe the uh, boat captain's um, insensitivity right, to the other members of the party, his um, uh, hurried uh, actions, right, his manner as uh, aware, mono no aware mo shirade, right, here at the bottom, mono no aware mo shirade, to not know mono no aware, right, to lack the um, uh, feelings of mono no, mono no aware, to be insensitive or unsympathetic, right, especially in this case to those around him. Right, so he is in this hurry to, um, to get the boat going, right, so he wants everyone to board. The tide is full, the wind's coming up, he shouted. But everyone views this as lacking uh, an understanding of mono no aware. In the tale of Genji, we have a similar reference. I've heard that a person like this is an insensitive sort, one who bears little sympathy. Same idea, mono no aware mo shirade. Shirade meaning shiranai, to not know. So, to get back to Norinaga's view of what the tale of Genji was intended to convey, right, this is simply one interpretation, one possible interpretation that differs from earlier uh, ideas. Mm -hmm. Norinaga uh, held that human beings may not always be capable of suppressing or controlling those very inherently human emotions those feelings of being moved or touched or inspired. Even though those feelings may indeed go against reason. And in this case, we're talking about uh, especially Buddhist concepts, the teachings of Buddhism or Confucianism, morals, ethics, um, that sort of reasoning. We have, we all know that we have these very, very inherently human uh, feelings. It is human nature to react in a certain way in some situations, even though we know that those actions may indeed go against what we have been taught. For example, the shining Genji and the radiant Fujitsubo, our ideal, romantic, larger than life hero and heroine who should be above, right? any um, misdeeds, uh, they should be able to, to control uh, their desires, their feelings. But indeed, we know that they are humans. Right? We know that indeed they are humans. And they are unable right, to suppress their emotions and to refrain, for example, from meeting. Right? Uh, Genji is unable to uh, stop himself from meeting the Fujitsubo, even though he knows uh, that would go against morals. 
So again, uh, Monono Aware uh, is this spontaneous, um, emotional, inherently human response uh, to something that moves us, to something that makes us um, feel something, right? feel something to the extent that we cannot help but react. Okay, even though we know that our actions may eventually um, bring divine retribution or um, some other punishment. Uh, Norinaga's new theory, uh, his new interpretation, allowed for a uniquely literary interpretation. Right? A literary, and this is the key word here, of the tale of Genji because it did not rely directly on the ideas, the teachings of Buddhism, Confucianism, uh, morals, reasoning, etc. Okay, so this is a literary interpretation uh, of the tale of Genji. One, it is one possible interpretation. Okay, let's move, move on then. Uh, next set of slides will be the new handout that is available at the front of the room. If you don't have it already, please go ahead and pick it up now. Now we're going to be talking about Makura um, no Soshi, the pillow book. Okay. Now when we look at the um, pillow book, um, there is one particular um, concept uh, or theme that uh, runs throughout this work that we should probably look at first before we actually look at um, passages from the text. Okay. And we'll see why in a minute, because it is sometimes used in relation to the concept that we just looked at, and that was aware or mono aware. But let's look at this new concept, okashi. Right. okashi. There are actually a number of usages of this term as well. Let's look at the first usage. Okay, that is why there is a one right next to the term. This um, idea of okashi is used to describe, one, a sense of beauty, a response toward the charming, uh, something that we feel is charming or perhaps delightful, pleasurable. Right? This sense right, of beauty can be described as okashi. Makura no Soshi, the pillow book, is said to contain some 400 or so examples of okashi, or usages of this term. Okashi, as I just mentioned, is often used in parallel with or in relation to the concept that we learned just a few minutes ago, and that was aware. Right? There are some differences, though. And what would those be? Well, you can look at aware as having more of an emphasis on the deep, <coughs> intense, sometimes more serious feelings, <coughs> which occur in response to something that moves us or inspires us when we are touched, when we are moved by something. That would be described as aware. Right? Okashi, on the other hand, is somewhat lighter in tone. It is perhaps a more objective response, right? that is based on intellect or wit. So it's a little bit more objective. Aware, perhaps a little more subjective. Both the um, Tale of Genji and uh, the new work that we will be looking at, Makura no Soshi, contain examples of both of these uh, concepts, both Mono no Aware and uh, Okashi. And we will see how those are used uh, in the text here in a, few, in a few minutes. I'll go ahead and give you a few seconds to write this information now.
of the slides again, um, feel free to come uh, to, to see them at the end of the lecture. All right, I'll be happy to show you any slides that you need to um, uh, look at further. Okay. Now, the second usage of okashi right, is used to describe something that is a little bit more humorous, all right, something that might be termed amusing or comical, even absurd or ridiculous. Okay, so we're talking about something that is more uh, funny, all right? And so often it can be a little bit more entertaining. Right? We will see more examples of this usage of okashi in later periods as well. Uh, for example, kyogen plays, a linked verse um, that are going to be um, developed in the Muromachi period. Right? We will also see examples of this kind of um, Okashi in Kokkeibon, right? Senryu and Kyoka, these are poems. Right? Kokkeibon is a type of um, a fictional work uh, of the Edo period. And then Senryu and Kyoka are these witty, um, entertaining poems, uh, sometimes um, that comment um, satirically right? uh, on uh, problems, issues in society. Um, in the time that the, um, the poem was written, during the time in which the poem was written. So we see examples of this usage of okashi uh, in these kinds of uh, works of literature. Right? And we will see that um, uh, this usage of okashi is uh, in many cases tied to the lifestyle and the experiences of the commoners, of the masses. Right? <coughs> Through most of the Heian period, uh, remember that literature in the Heian period is going to be written by members of the court, for members of the court, right, to be read and appreciated by members of the nobility. This will gradually change. We will see a shift in the audience and the writers. Right? The commoners, the masses, will have a much bigger role in the appreciation of literature and the fine arts as we move on into the later periods. Um, I mentioned a while ago that we still use the word aware, right, used in that sense of pity or pathos, tragedy, um, even in modern Japanese today. We also have the term okashi, right, uh, the adjective okashi in modern Japanese, used in a number of senses, and the most common would probably be uh, one that is tied, linked um, rather closely to this second usage of the classical term, okashi. Right? And that would be the funny, the ridiculous, the absurd, uh, comical. Right? Uh, most of you know, however, that okashi in modern Japanese can also sometimes be used to refer to something that is strange or unusual, mm, um, odd, okay? or even something that is suspicious depending on the context in which it is used, the situation. All right, if I move on. Okay. Now, let's look at some uh, specific uh, passages from uh, the Puno book. This is a scene from uh, the illustrated narrative scrolls, Makura no Soshi, depicting um, some court women, all right? Notice that they, in their, dressed in their juni hitoe, their 12-layered kimono, right, the fashion of the day, holding the fan in front of their face to cover, right, their, their face and their expression. This was probably the fashion or the custom of the day, as it was also um, considered etiquette to remain hidden behind the curtains, especially if a man might be visiting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's move on. Um, to give you a little background on this particular work um, first, before we look at the uh, passages, um, Makura no Soshi was written by a court lady uh, named Sei Shonabo. Right. She served in um, the court of Emperor Ichijo. We have seen this name before. Uh, however, Sei Shonabo uh, served um, Teishi, right, one of the consorts, uh, to the Emperor Ichijo. And I emphasize the word one of because if you recall, um, I'll go ahead and put this information up first. Uh, recall that Emperor Ichijo had another consort, and that was Shoshi. 
Uh, she was the daughter of Fujiwara no Michinaga, remember that very powerful member of the Fujiwara clan who married his daughters into the imperial family right, and achieved a very, very strong position at court through uh, those politically arranged marriages, sekkan politics. Right. Teishi, on the other hand, is um, the daughter of Fujiwara no Michitaka, right, the brother of Michinaga. And so the women, Teishi and Shoshi, are related, they are cousins. Right? But after uh, Teishi's father's death, after Michitaka's death, uh, the brother, Michinaga, will rise to power, and he is going to be the one who uh, essentially controls the imperial court through, again, Sekkan politics for much of his career. Right? So, as a result of that, Teishi's role as consort to Emperor Ichijo is going to be severely diminished. Right? Um, she's going to find it much more difficult to assert her position right, at court right, as the emperor's wife after uh, Shoshi comes into the emperor's court right, and, and she becomes uh, another wife or a consort to the emperor Ichijo. Teishi um, will die very young. Right, she dies at the young age of 24, right, soon after uh, Shoshi uh, is married to the emperor. Right, so she leads a rather unfortunate life. Right, she dies young, and um, toward the end of her career, the end of her life at court, um, her position becomes very, very limited. Right, she's not able to assert her, her um, position at court um, because of Shoshi, who now is backed, supported by her very strong father, Michinaga. Right, is able to um, assert her position uh, much more effectively in the court of Emperor Ichijo. Now, it is not just these two women, Teishi and Shoshi, right, who develop a sort of rivalry right, because they are both married to Emperor Ichijo. It's also the women who serve them at court who develop a rivalry. So, say Shonago, who served Teishi, and then the lady Murasaki, Murasaki Shikibu, who served Shoshi, also developed a sort of rivalry. Right? Because it was the <coughs> women who served each woman at court um, who also wanted to be able to have their consort, right, the consort that they are serving, uh, be the one that is most powerful, most influential right, in the court of that emperor. This type of writing that we see in the Makura no Soshi is an example, uh, a representative example of a new style of writing right, developed um, at this time, and that will be essay type writing. Right? In the Japanese, referred to as Zuihitsu. Zuihitsu. Um, Makura no Soshi was completed around the year 1001, okay, so just a few years probably before the completion of the tale of Genji as we know it now, with a few additions being made later. All right, so again, um, Sei Shonago and the Lady Murasaki were contemporaries. Right? They were active at the same time, in the same period. Okay? Um, this particular work is uh, made up of about 300 or so chapters, right? so several, several more than the tale of Genji, but you will find that these chapters are of varying length in most cases, much, much shorter than the chapters in the tale of Genji. The, content, the content and the format are also going to be different. The style of writing that is used is also different from the tale of Genji. If you look at the original uh, uh, text of both works, this will become immediately evident. The writing style of Makura no Soshi is rhythmic, quick moving, uh, varied and compressed or compact, um, as is noted by Ivan Morris, who has done a translation of this work, and this is the translation that I have used for the class today. Okay. If you look at the tale of Genji, if you look at the original, you will immediately notice that the text is very, very long. It is flowing, but it is long, and sometimes it is even difficult to decipher when or where uh, one sentence ends and the next sentence starts. Right? Because the sentences, the text is so um, lengthy. Right? The, uh, the rhythm in the Makura no Soshi is much, much uh, um, more um, fast-paced. Right? It is quick-moving, 
uh, the chapters themselves are easier to uh, get through because of their relatively short length. Murasaki Shikibu and um, Sei Shonagon were contemporaries, as I mentioned. They, the two also developed a rivalry of sorts. This is what Murasaki Shikibu has to say about her contemporary, Shonagon. Um, Sei Shonagon has the most extraordinary air of self-satisfaction. Yet, if we stop to examine those Chinese writings of hers that she so presumptuously scatters about the place, we find that they are full of imperfections, They're full of errors. Someone who makes such an effort to be different from others is bound to fall in people's esteem. And I can only think that her future will be a hard one. So she has um, written this rather scathing commentary um, opinion of her contemporary, Sei Shunabu. This, of course, is written in her own personal diary. Right? So it was perhaps not meant to be seen by others. Right? We know the diary now because uh, it has been published. Right? And it's it has been made available to the public. Um, but it is, again, a rather scathing um, commentary on uh, someone in her um, close vicinity. Right? So the two probably did not get along very well. Just to mention, um, Murasaki Shikib notes that Sei um, Shonagun has scattered uh, these Chinese writings. All right? Remember that it was the men, the Heian male courtiers, who were expected to have a knowledge of the Chinese classics. Women were not expected, necessarily, to be able to display a knowledge or understanding of Chinese classics, at least in terms of publicly displaying that knowledge. Right? But indeed, they did have a knowledge, in many cases, a very good, extensive knowledge of the Chinese classics. Right, and so this is probably what Murasaki Shikibu is referring to when she says that Sei Shonagon is trying to be different right, from others. Um, it was waka, it was uh, wabu, Japanese style prose and literature that the women were expected to uh, be familiar with. Or if they were going to write uh, literature, it would be wabu, Japanese style writing, right, not Chinese. Now, um, there are three uh, major formats for the chapters for the various episodes of the Makurama Soshi. All right, we will only have time to look at the first of the three uh, categories or formats, and that is going to be the categorical, um, the category that is called categorical, uh, because um, these chapters talk about um, certain things, right, mono. Right. For example, we have a chapter called Elegant Things, right? or Unsuitable Things. Or sometimes the chapters might be entitled as for the topic of such and such. Right? So, say, Shonabon has divided up <coughs> these chapters into certain categories right, based on their content. And so scholars have come up with this term, categorical, to describe these particular chapters. The other chapters, some of them have um, a journal-like flavor. They are similar uh, to a journal entry. And uh, these chapters describe the court life uh, that Sei Shonabon witnessed uh, in her service to Teishi, right, the consort of Emperor Ichijo. In fact, it is Teishi, that young woman, um, who is the focus of these entries. So we can see that Sei Shonabon was a devoted uh, uh, lady um, to uh, the consort Teishi. The third of the categories or formats is one that is simply uh, termed random thoughts. Right? Again, this is essay style writing. Right? So you can consider these as um, perhaps memos or notes that perhaps Sei Shonabon jotted down. Right. Uh, and remember that um, this is a new, uh, new style of writing. Uh, it is a style of writing that is going to influence later examples of Zuihitsu writing. Uh, we will see in the next period, the Kamakura period, how um, uh, the Makura, uh, Makura Masoshi, uh, the pillow book, has influenced uh, those works. Okay, so look at slide one, please, uh, in your handout. This is the very uh, opening passage, first passage in the work. Uh, most Japanese uh, will be able to recall or recite uh, this very first opening line 
of chapter one of Mahakurama Soshi, it is Haruwa Akebono. Haruwa meaning spring, and Akebono meaning dawn. So what is being referred to here? Well, say Shonadon uh, is saying that, well, in the spring, the most affecting, the most beautiful, or the most, new, the most moving thing is going to be dawn. And then she continues this chapter by saying, well, in summer, all right, it's the nights, okay? Natsu wa yoru, right? And then in autumn, it's such and such. In winter, it's something else. So let's look at this chapter. In spring, it is the dawn that is most beautiful. As the light creeps over the hills, their outlines are dyed a faint red, and wisps of purplish cloud trail over them. In summer, the nights, not only when the moon shines, but on dark nights too, as the fireflies flit to and fro, and even when it rains, how beautiful it is. Hopefully you have picked up on uh, this reference to okashi, right, the term that we were introduced to a while ago, these references to um, something being beautiful or affecting, right, charming, delightful. Remember the first usage of okashi. This is the usage that we see here. Now, in the first line itself, um, the translator has indicated that in spring, it is the dawn that is most beautiful. We should keep in mind, however, that the word, the term okashi, is not actually used in the original text. Remember that it was haruwa akebo. But it is implied, right, it is implied that in spring, it is the dawn that is most okashi, or most beautiful. And notice in the um, text referring to the summer nights, right, um, for Seisho and at least, in the summer, it's the nighttime um, that is most affecting or most okashi. And it's not just those nights on which we have a full moon to appreciate, but dark nights too, right, as the fireflies flit to and fro, and even when it rains. Right? How beautiful it is. Okay? So this is an indication of say Shonabo's, um, at least personal, all right, um, aesthetics. What she finds beautiful, okashi, or affecting. Right? And it's not just the perfect full moon, all right, perfect night on which we have a bright, shiny moon, all right, to help us see, but it's also those dark nights that she finds affecting. Right, even rainy nights appeal to her. Right? And remember this, because we will encounter this sort of um, uh, aesthetics again uh, in a later uh, work of literature. Now, um, the next, uh, in autumn. In autumn, the evenings. Right? So it's the evenings that are okashi, when the glittering sun sinks close to the edge of the hills and the crows fly back to their nests in threes and fours and twos. More charming still is a file of wild geese, like specks in the distant sky. When the sun has set, one's heart is moved by the sound of the wind and the hum of the insects. So let's look at this passage. Uh, hopefully you picked up on the uh, reference to Okashi in the line, more charming still is a file of wild geese. However, um, if you look at the original, it's a little bit difficult to detect this in the translation itself. If you look at the original text, there is actually a reference to not only okashi, but also a reference to awai. So this would be a good example of how the two terms are used uh, in parallel with one another, referring to a similar idea, right? So these are not going to be um, that different in meaning or usage. Okay. Um, looking at the original, right? the crows fly back to their nests in threes and fours and twos. Right? This was the same a while ago, but in fact there is another line that has been um, omitted in the translation, a moving scene enough. Right, so this scene in which the crows are flying back to their nests in the evening hours as the sun sets, um, and they're flying back to their nests in twos and threes and fours, this scene is rather moving enough. Right? 
飛びゆくさえ、あわれなる。あわれ。And even more charming still is a file of wild geese. And the more charming is referred to in the original as okashi. Okay, so this is an example of how the two are used pretty much in parallel. So there is an overlap right, in meaning and、uh, usage in this case.、Okay. Everyone has gotten that now? Okay.、Um, but let's move on. Well, it is almost 12. Why don't I go ahead and stop there today and we will look at the rest of the pillow book、uh, at the beginning of the lecture next week. And then we will move right on into the Kamakura period right, and look at new works of literature right, that have new topics, new themes. Please note that tomorrow, tomorrow I will not be able to have office hours for you to discuss your term paper, your outline, your bibliography. Unfortunately, I have to attend a number of meetings tomorrow afternoon. So, if you need to speak with me about your term paper or about your outline, please do not hesitate to make an appointment, arrange a separate time and day that is convenient for you to come、um, see me or at my office. You can email me or you can come to me right now and discuss a time, a day that you would like to meet. I will have office hours next Friday, all right, and that will be the last. Opportunity for you to speak with me、um, unless you arrange an appointment before the deadline for the outline. Again, the deadline is December the 16th, right, two weeks from today. Okay? Alright, have a good week and we'll see you again.